emitted far too many tonnes of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere than we should have done. Australia's uh, oil uh, pr production peaked in 2000 and it's now falling. And uh, it peaked at just the right time when prices rose. It's already affecting the outer suburbs. If you have a look at the um, oil, uh, or rather, petrol use per capita is falling in Australia and uh, since 2004. So I think we have, it's, it's pretty urgent. I think the main change is in people's heads. After that, I think once, it's, once we form it as a, we as, as citizens decide that we are going to reduce travel, I think each of us can decide best how we, how we can reduce our own travel, as it were. It's part of a bigger debate. We're zeroing in as, as if transport is the be-all and end-all. It's not. It's the way we want the city to be. What, what sort of city do we want? How do we want to trade with other cities? How do we want to live? How do we want to have our holidays? It's all about that. Transport is one part of that. It's not the part of it. Like it or not, we have a physical structure to our, to our cities which have been based on previous models of the economy, basically, in our case, cheap fuel and the car. And those structures are going to be a major impediment to the tr sort of transformation which needs to take place. But the model that we're using to think about the future for the next 25 years is starts with the idea that the future will have to be um, a distributed paradigm rather than the old centralised paradigm. That things are going to have to become much more localised um, and networked localised. At the moment we have only a limited amount of road space that's available we choose to allocate it as we do at the moment which is basically the vehicles typically 1.1 <coughs> people in them uh, whereas we know the sustainable modes and the efficient modes are other than that they're public transport they're cycling and walking so i think there's an inevitable part of getting towards the future that we've been talking about which involves a very different use of road space Currently, the, the motoring body in this state um, says, you know, bus lanes are great, but don't take away a traffic lane. We're not happy with taking away a traffic lane. So until we stop, start having people change their, their ideas about what's, what's a good transport system, we're going to struggle to reallocate that road space. Low competitiveness of public transport in terms of speed with a car. And there are a number of ways you can go about that. Um, one is, of course, to make buses, uh, trams and trains to go faster. Another is to make them go more frequently so you don't have to wait. Uh, but another quite important aspect is what Nick hinted as. It's, it's, it's the connectivity. It's not just the connectivity of the, of the existing network so that um, buses and train timetables time coincide. It is also about actually redesigning the existing network so we have this kind of connectivity at every, ideally at every activity center. And that is work that hasn't been done in Melbourne for a number of decades, redesigning the network to fit the current urban structure and actually make it possible to travel from any point in the city to any other point in the city with minimum resistance. Part of linking land use planning and transport is, is this understanding. In fact, there are many, many diverse systems that operate on streets and roads and it's not actually just about transport. You know, it's also about public life and it's about uh, economic and community interaction. So. Um, I think in, in terms of the discussion of reallocation of space or dollars, I'd be saying it's, it's reallocation of space and dollars, but a refocusing of the you know, design and amenity issues on those parts of a road reserve, to talk quite physically, on the areas which support sustainable transport and uh, community interaction. Yes, I'd emphasise the locality. I think all new development on the fringes of our city should be self-sustaining in terms of jobs and offering houses for life from the womb to the tomb so that in fact you develop uh, communities where people can be born and move their housing and their job and educational opportunities until they die. We don't have to rebuild Melbourne, we can have a micro change. In other words, what we can do is just resurrect existing uh, strip shopping centres and so on that are there already. And make shopping there rather than at the, um, the drive-in shopping centres. So we don't have to rebuild Melbourne, in which case uh, I don't think there, there is a great time constraint on that. We can change quite fast. Aren't we perhaps looking for the future as something like a slow city, a city that is actually based on much slower movement than we know today? And um, if we look at the speed competitiveness of cars with public transport on, on motorised modes, maybe it's actually a matter of bringing the speed of cars down. 
um, letting cars grind down in congestion and where that isn't enough, um, deliberately taking away or making road space slower. So uh, all our movement is actually at a slower level. Is that a model for the future? Vancouver is slower. If they didn't build bridges, they kept congestion as a tool. And the outcome of that is that the time that people travel to work in Vancouver is slower now than it was, it's, far, it's less than it was 10 years ago. It's the only city in the world, the, the dispersed city in the world, where travel times have reduced for the journey to work. We need to invest in a public transport system. It depends how far ahead you want to look, look, but it's got to be two, three or four times the coverage and service levels we have today to achieve the, uh, the future we're looking for. Well, we might have a vision of the future where the existing radial freeways into Melbourne have only one lane each way for cars, with the other lanes used for alternative purposes, maybe a bike tube for high-speed bike travelling um, with uh, some ability to do it out regardless of the weather. Or maybe we turn it over to various forms of agricultural use. But some ideas that, that the future does not necessarily depend for uh, the health of the city on the arteries, which are those which have been given over to cars before. To be successful, to bring the whole community along with us in this process, or, or we'll be constantly butting our heads. And the reason for that is uh, too often sometimes people's natural instincts on transport solutions are, are in fact a little bit backwards from the reality of the situation where sort of the solution to transport problems is adding more roads when we sort of realize that, that makes the problem worse in most cases, uh, that higher density uh, development is actually bad for transport when we know in fact that it's uh, typically good for transport, uh, that we don't need bike lanes because there are no people bicycling. Um, so a lot of things that, that, that people have a, a little bit backwards, and there's certainly um, nothing wrong with that thought process, but it's probably that larger cultural thought process that we need to bring people along with in order to see some real change happen. We've somehow got to change now and stop making things worse, which is what we're doing right now, as we are making things continually worse. The past 30, 40 years have given us something that's completely unsustainable and business as usual is just not an option. I think we've got to move seriously towards sustainable modes of transport um, and to, to low carbon forms of transport that will be sustainable for our future. As well as thinking about ways in which to invest in public transport to make, um, if you like, the transport poor areas of the city more accessible, to also think about how they might make the transport rich areas of the city more affordable so that we can actually get maybe a different model of investment. So we invest in places like this to make them available to, uh, as an option, rather than seeing the low cost option being an outer urban option. We need our sustainable transport system, but we'll need it to be accessible and affordable for all parts of our community, people with mobility issues, older people, people with families, and that requires investment in supporting infrastructure as well. One of the important things that we haven't talked about that much today is the public and political will to change and the ability to go against the three AWs and the Herald Suns and actually do things that are temporarily unpalatable for long-term benefit. I've got five small items on my list. 30% improvement in uh, terms of reducing the number of trips by 30%, uh, shifting 30% of trips to cycling and walking, um, increase vehicle occupancy and make a 30% um, improvement in greenhouse emissions from that point of view, uh, increase kilometres per litre, um, in other words, smaller cars, smaller vehicles, uh, less consumption of fuel, and finally, um, renewable fuels. And if you add up those 30% um, and uh, uh, sort of multiply them, uh, you get an 83% uh, reduction in greenhouse emissions. Mm -hmm.